really excited about our first talk of the day, which is by Haley Hughes from Shopify. Uh, Haley is a UX manager on our Polaris design system, joining us from Austin. So I actually don't think we've ever met face to face, just lots of calls. Super excited to have her here with us today. That's amazing. Let's welcome Haley Hughes. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here at Remote Design Week. And if you'll give me just a minute, I'll share my screen and we can get started. To tell you just a little bit about myself, I, I currently work, as Jen said, on the Polaris design system at Shopify. And prior to Shopify, I worked on design systems at IBM and Airbnb. Today, I'm gonna to talk about why it's really important to create unity, not uniformity with design systems and how I've tried to live up to this mantra at every place that I've worked. Danella Meadows, author of Thinking in Systems, once said, we thought we could control systems. We found out we can't, but we can dance with them. No matter how many boxes you draw around them, design systems always seem to do their own thing. At IBM, I was asked to create a design language that would unify a portfolio of over 3000 software products. Surprisingly, we took an approach that didn't involve building a component library. IBM had tried that before. And while it certainly created a lot of consistency, the product quality and the brand expression left a lot to be desired. This set of plug and play widgets produced products that had a uniform look and feel where everything was exactly the same as everything else. Yet things still felt cluttered and busy and difficult to use. Back in the 1970s, when IBM's first design program was put into place, Design director Elliot Noyes described a subtle nuance between unity and uniformity. He said that unity is a family of ideas with a distinctive character that's all held together by excellence. On the other hand, uniformity is about following a consistent style, like being a military branch. This is the design language approach we wanted to avoid. Consistency in the absence of good design can lead to consistently undesirable outcomes. So instead of coding components, I was asked to study the brand legacy of a hundred year old company, including the designs of Paul Rand and Charles and Ray Ames. Like an ethnographer, I dug through the archives and traveled across the world searching for bits of DNA, the grammar of our design language. One book that I ran across gave specific principles and success criteria for what IBM should look like, sound like, feel like, and perform like, guiding the experience around things like a set of principles and recommendations without being prescriptive. The only rule that I found was no clip art. In Germany, I visited an office that had a museum of IBM machines. We captured footage of old typewriters and magnetic tape reels and used it as inspiration for our animation guidelines. The speed and accuracy of the machine motion aligned with a sense of efficiency and effectiveness that we wanted to provide our users. We also found posters and punch cards that had big and small data sets which could be translated into how our users would want to zoom in or zoom out to, an ex to explore data visualizations in their software tools. Creating a foundation built on the rationale and aesthetic of a brand was kind of like designing a game of soccer. We were making the field of colors and type and icons and inviting product teams in to play with them. Because we didn't build a component library, teams would need to combine things in hundreds of different ways that best fit their users' needs and make their own components. They created these piece of, pieces of work called design guides. And back in 2015, that served as the place for context-specific patterns and principles across different kinds of experiences, like a security experience or an analytics experience. Today, in companies like Shopify, where I work, we're calling these local design systems, which I'll talk 
about a little bit later. As IBM invested in design and grew the design population to the thousands, we worked with a newly assembled brand and content team to evolve the design language. We created a brand philosophy around different values like partnership, progress, serving society, and most importantly, the relationships between people and machines. The team created an open source typeface called IBM Plex in many global languages, which you can download. Um, and the architectural details of the typeface were used to influence the look and feel of the iconography too. Each icon had a set of key shapes and hard and soft edges that could be applied across different metaphors as a sort of visual grammar that kept our icons set harmonious. The machine motion was boiled down into productive and expressive easing curves that helped us be more opinionated about how we move. And the iconic IBM blue became our primary action color in our products, making it obvious that it was there to guide you through your work. This end-to-end -end experience meant that no matter how a person interfaced with IBM, whether it was an event or on a screen or with an IBM employee, there are a set of values in place to help move people thoughtfully forward. With my first design language at IBM, designing a system for 3000 products felt more like a rodeo than a dance. Telling stories and giving rationale that inspires the why behind the design is key to unlocking flexibility and creativity while enabling teams to stay on beat with systems. Jesenia Perez-Cruz, our senior UX lead for Polaris at Shopify, nicely sums up in her book, Expressive Design Systems, what my time building concepts at IBM was all about. She says, codify what it means to create a product that feels like your company. What decisions would your company make that others wouldn't? At IBM, I learned that your design system is only as strong as your brand values and philosophy. So now I'm going to share with you my second lesson and at company number two uh, and second design system. So when I joined at Airbnb, they already had their design language system in place. The team had redesigned the product and out of that they created a system, but trying to build both at the same time definitely came with challenges. The system was a template, there was a code library and some tools. And as a new hire, you would get a one hour onboarding and then you were sent on your way. If you got stuck, there'd be a weekly office hour you could go to, but that was kind of the extent of the design system support for almost two years. The core team who had designed and built the system knew the guidelines like the back of their hand, but they never wrote them down. So as more teams tried to use it, people started asking questions like me. As a new hire on the team, I asked, when should I use gradients? And someone would say, hmm, they're for special moments. To this day, I'm not quite sure what qualifies as a special moment. And making me guess didn't help me necessarily work faster or easier. So out of my own struggle came a reframe of our team's mission, not focused on the product, but on people. How could we operate as system stewards who build trust with the community who's trying to use our design language? To understand teams' perceptions of our DLS, our design language system, we asked them to write down love letters and breakup letters to the design system as if it was a person. We wanted to understand their relationship with it. Some of the letters read, DLS, I love you because you make my life so easy but sometimes adding new components or modifying existing ones is so hard. And dear DLS, I love you, but I need a break because there isn't a clear way to collaborate or make changes or updates. One of the first things that we worked on was a contribution model and a partnership program to hack the system. In the two years prior, designers didn't really have a network of people and a place where they could share local systems knowledge. 
nominated by their managers, designers and developers would raise their hand to work on improving the system. And they were given time to co-design new patterns and theming and whatever else they could dream up. It wasn't about constraints, but innovation. One designer in our program we surveyed said that showing up to the partnership program had been the best thing about the design system since it was created. As people started to contribute all these components back to the system, we made shared ownership of the design language part of the career framework at Airbnb. As part of organizational development, teams and individuals were rewarded for participating in systems work, not just product work. Having worked on a second design system at Airbnb, the value of unity, not uniformity, unfolded a bit differently. The goal this time had been to unify the community and use that to drive contribution and sharing. You can read more about the partnership program on Airbnb's blog. Our contribution model had over 12 teams contributing uh, a few months into the pilot, and it was essential for creating resiliency instead of rigid ways of working. At Airbnb, I learned that your design system is only as strong as the relationships that you have with the teams who use it. Nine months ago, I joined Shopify to work on the Polaris design system. In 2017, our design system was created to support Shopify's core admin, helping people manage their storefronts. Its purpose was to create a shared understanding across teams and a consistent experience across all of our users' touch points. We had a lot of early success with Polaris. Products definitely felt more cohesive, which built trust with our merchants, but there was a new problem. Teams felt like the system was limiting their creativity. Today, our teams design for a wide range of environments and audiences. They make products that serve merchants, partners, in-store staff, and our products live everywhere from people's homes to brick and mortar buildings to warehouses. The tech spectrum includes mobile, desktop, hardware, VR, even assistive robots. Components in the current system aren't flexible enough to fit all of these situations. So as a result, our teams have made new systems to fill the gap. Teams designing for specific experiences like an in-store selling experience or a store management experience or a conversational UI experience need a place to document their work and share this context. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, they're creating local systems. Local systems enable teams to intentionally build off of our global foundations, like our type and color and icons, while differentiating by experience. They're structured around the steps along a user's journey, not organized by product lines in an org chart. Local systems house the principles, design, and code that are crafted for a unique scenario. Teams also make new components and patterns to address needs which the foundations alone can't solve. Local systems are shared across teams and they have common contexts, but they're not used by everyone. They're often needed for experiences that share different kinds of contexts, like a shared audience, the people who use and experience your products. In our case, it might be a person who picks and packs shipped goods or a buyer who's checking on their delivery a shared environment, which is the setting and conditions in which a user operates, where there might be a whole range of distractions like robot machines or forklifts making loud noises. A shared task, so the work to be done or a job to be undertaken where someone might be extending their arms, for example, 100 times a day to scan a barcode. A shared domain, which is the knowledge specific to a specialized field of study, like data science, where we can create our insights dashboards. A shared brand is the values and expressions that differentiate an experience that are tied together by certain elements like our color and type and icons. And a shared platform, technologies that underpin an experience like a warehouse check or a tablet for in-store checkout. If you're just in need of a few extra components, you might not need a local system. The best time to create a local system is when you're extending foundations to create offerings that represent new experiences at Shopify. These can 
fall across a range of more functional products and services to more expressive events and websites. Design systems are meant to support, not stifle creative expression. One major challenge in working with them is striking a balance between consistency and flexibility. Usually in design systems, we tend to have an inside out approach where we focus on the artifacts that we make like products, flows and components. But these artifacts are just one perspective. They're our response to a host of activity happening outside of Shopify, like our audiences, interactions in their environment, the modes of use they're in when they're doing specific tasks and the experience they have on multiple devices. When you flatten those layers into what we observe and what we make, there's a feedback loop that we're creating by enabling people to explore and experiment from different altitudes. There's a feedback loop as well between our global foundations and our local systems, a kind of push and pull dependency. And the loop works when a product team builds their local system and they pull in the core principles and elements from our foundations. Then local systems will push innovations which benefit all teams back to the global foundations via contribution. The contributions spur an evolution of those foundations and core elements get tested again and adopted locally. So if that was a lot of information, here's an example of the push and pull effect in action. A couple of our designers, Ricardo and Toby, who own a local design system, realized that the point of sale app they were designing for a selling experience would be used in stores that had a lot of variable lighting conditions that were often too bright or dim. So they introduced a light and dark mode in their local design system and pushed that work back to the Global Foundations team. The pull is where our Global Foundations team extended the light and dark mode contribution to make it flexible for other types of indoor and outdoor contexts where lighting conditions vary greatly. Audiences with low vision or eye strain might also have personal preferences for light and dark UI settings. So these are things that can be used across everything. And the modes are being tested across Shopify in places like shipping or store management before being sh shared back out for everyone to pull from. While a primary feedback loop exists between global foundations and local systems, there are also many smaller feedback loops amongst local systems and product teams. Local systems are owned by product teams and they're interconnected by shared context. As mentioned, they have similar environments, domain knowledge, audiences, technologies. There are also shared micro contexts like are our audience but audiences both multitasking when their attention is divided and their focus is split? Do our platforms both support the same devices and need to account for a range of internet availability? Do the environments that our audiences work in have physically demanding tasks like repeatedly reaching for screens or lifting heavy objects? These interactions signal where experiences overlap. They can be opportunities for cross-pollination of ideas and design solutions and reusable code. With many systems at play, our role at Shopify is to make sure that we don't force them into separate boxes, but instead guide the relationships between them. We think of design systems not only as what we make, but what's affected by what we make. Products need to work together within Shopify's ecosystem and our users' worlds. In order to guide how systems and by extension products interact, teams need to con connect work through shared context. As architect Ilil Saarinen says, it's important to always design a thing by considering its next larger context, a chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in an environment, and an environment in a city plan. This is how we intend to evolve Polaris from a North Star to a system of systems. At Shopify, so far I've learned that your system is only as strong as your understanding of the context where it lives. So as I wrap up, here are a few key takeaways to remember. Designing for unity, not uniformity, is about creating relationships. A unified system ensures that everything goes with everything else, like a game or a puzzle. Whereas uniformity lacks a point of view because it only uses control to limit creativity 
where everything is the same as everything else. Philosophy first, system second. Your beliefs, your values, your principles should come before you start building a UI kit or coding components. They're the rationale that your decisions for each element rely on, so don't skip them. Relationships first, systems second. Get to know the people who will use your system as people, not just as users or adopters before making it. Understand their feelings, have them write love letters, understand their needs, their aspirations, and use those to design a system that meets them where they are and guides them on their path. Context first, system second. Systems never live in isolation. There are many feedback loops across systems and between the things that we observe and the things that we make. We have to build a deep understanding for how our systems will show up in our users' worlds and in our company's ecosystem before we create them. Remember, it's a dance. One, two, one, two, never reverse them. It might take some fancy footwork, but expressing brand values, creating sharing communities, and considering the contexts for variation in a design language are keys to unlocking a healthy system. These approaches have helped me get into a groove where I've been able to bring more unity to IBM, Airbnb, and Shopify. And I hope that they've given you some new dance moves too. Thank you. Yay. Thanks so much, Haley. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Haley. Um, I think a lot of folks were already kind of a really big fan of your content from other conferences. We saw a lot of conversations in chat. Uh, and it seems like many other folks who today got to uh, learn more about Polaris and your journey as well uh, are really thankful for the learnings that you shared.